This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host. Welcome, everyone. This is the Meaningful Sport Podcast, and I am your host, Nora Ronkainen. Meaningful Sport is a series of discussions on the why and how involvement in sport and physical activity can be an important part of a life worth living. If you are interested in the theme, you might also want to check out MeaningfulSport.com. There you can find podcast show notes, read a blog, and access many resources for further explorations of Meaningful Sport. Today's episode is the second part of our discussion with Dr. Anna Kavora on how gender informs meaning in sport. In the first part, we explored Anna's work on intersecting identities in women's martial arts, as well as her current project titled Transforming Gender Boundaries in Sport, an ethnographic and participatory action research study in trans-inclusive sport contexts. In today's discussion, we continue exploring the dominant gender discourses in sport context and what can be done to challenge them. We also discuss the dilemma of women's only training groups in martial arts. While these groups can be useful for attracting more women to male-dominated martial art gyms, there are some possible problems with them, such as reinforcing the gender binary and hierarchical understandings of gender. What are the ways we can use this strategy well? Dr. Anna Kavora has completed several interesting research projects on gender in sport. She completed her PhD in sport sciences at the University of Uvascula in Finland, with her research focusing on understanding women's identity negotiations in competitive judo cultures in Greece and Finland. After defending her PhD, she continued working as a postdoc researcher at the University of Uvascula in a project that focused on tackling discrimination against gender and sexual minorities in sport and physical education context. She then moved to the School of Sport and Service Management at the University of Brighton and currently works as a postdoc researcher in the Transforming Gender Boundaries in Sport project, which is funded by the Finnish Cultural Foundation. I hope you enjoy today's episode. We started going towards your more recent work, which is about challenging the gender binary and and thinking of alternatives. Maybe we move a step back towards uh, looking at sport culture, looking at how masculinity and how femininity has been constructed. So I think what you already said earlier was about identities are fluid and, and from this discursive perspective, we are accessing different discourses in our culture mm-hmm. and we have to negotiate them and identity is not something that is staying the same. So there's always this fluidity. But at the same time, I think we can also argue that in if we think about the cultural world of, of sport, there are some very enduring and very dominant discourses that have stayed with us for decades and even with these attempts by uh, by scholars and people in the field to destabilize these discourses these would be some uh, they still have an enduring impact on on our sport and how we imagine and practice sport so maybe we can first explore a little bit about what is this dominant uh, discursive or nar- narrative landscape of, of sport and how that is shaped by masculinities. Yeah, so like, uh, first of all, I think that sport is like one of, if not the only one of the very few like cultural systems right now that is still organized based on gender. Mm. So we separate, we separate people in categories based on their gender. So we don't do that in many other spheres of life anymore. And, uh, and in addition to that, 
we still see that uh, certain values that are often labeled as masculine, like, uh, for example, uh, muscular strength, like uh, competitiveness, uh, aggressiveness, and so on, uh, they are more valued than more valued in sport than other kind of like characteristics that are like often labeled as feminine. So this kind of like uh, essentialist understanding creates like like first separates people in categories and then creates hierarchies with these uh, these uh, categories. So and. Uh, like since we already said that the masculine is like uh, more valued, we have this uh, um, how to say like we have this like continuous like uh, male uh, dominance I think in most uh, sport cultures and this like understanding that uh, sport is naturally or men are naturally better in certain sports. I I think an interesting question in in terms of your you're a martial artist and and I've been doing also Muay Thai for the past I guess 5 years and and some of the things you see in martial art cultures is that some gyms are creating these uh training groups for women only and and you have been coaching a lot in in the women's training group in in Finland as well mm -hmm. and so I think those are quite contested in in certain ways that it could be creating uh, spaces for women where they feel that it's maybe easier to get into the gym and and what you talked about in your PhD research why are there so few women so the start of these women's training groups is often linked to creating these spaces that women feel more welcome and maybe less intimidated by that that environment. But on the other hand, there are also these dangers that uh, it just kind of reinforces the, the gender binary. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Exactly, exactly. Yes, yeah, so like, uh, I think in many things like, um, like, um, like, uh, are are very complex and there is not one solution fits uh, all so like when many people ask me this question and i always say that it uh, really depends on the culture of the gym and um, you know like depending on on how you organize these women core these women classes you might have different uh, different uh, results so i have seen yeah. them working really nicely when they work as as a first step let's say like to make women feel safer to come to the, to come into this male domain because yeah. sometimes you know it's not you don't feel very comfortable as a beginner woman to step into a gym that when you see there like 20 men and no other women or just one other woman and so on and uh, you feel that you don't know their moves and uh, you feel that maybe people are watching you and also like in a sport that requires contact and mm, you know yeah. like there you have other issues going on with uh, gender and contact and uh, and consent and and so on so this i have seen these groups working really nicely in gyms that they didn't have that many women they had the prob a problem with the gender balance ratio let's say and they used these courses as a kind of step to as a first step to help women feel safer and come to try the sport but then the end goal is, of course, the mixed gender practice. So the goal is not to keep the group separate. But uh -huh. the goal is to make the first step easier, to make them feel more comfortable. And then, you know, like the end goal is that we should at the end achieve a, a gender balance ratio in the gym. The, the same number of uh, 
like men and uh, women are about the same numbers that train there and that we all train together. Yeah. So I see it like uh, working really nicely there. But then I have seen also like, you know, this kind of uh, separation practices that, oh, we are having, you know, like competition training for men and competition training for women. And sometimes this is, you know, like it, it reinforces the belief that, you know, women cannot cope in them, that, you know, like men's competition training is harder and women cannot cope and we should have them in a separate group. And then this kind of reinforces st stereotypes. So it has the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it depends how you use the strategy, but I have seen it working really nicely if it's used like correctly and you know if it is needed in there because i mean if you are in a if you are in a gym that the gender ratio is like fine like almost 50 50 then you don't need this yeah i don't think you need this but uh, i haven't been in many such gyms most gyms have a problem with the gender balance ratio and they are thinking you know like what can they do to bring more women so this is one one strategy that can help if it is used like thoughtfully but of course then we also like create uh, like even if it is used properly it still creates certain problems like uh, for example like it is not very inclusive with like uh, uh, non-binary people so like yeah absolutely yeah when, when you call a like women's only class or something it might feel many people feel excluded so there are still problems, but I th I have seen it working nicely sometimes and uh, and so on. Like, um, but um, yeah, the goal is always to achieve a kind of like nice gender balance and also like diversity in the gym. I think you know, like if you have this kind of like if you find this like a diverse like group of people, it always means that there is something really good going on in the space i mean that there is a healthy environment for everybody to grow and uh, and so on so this is like the uh, in my opinion what we should try to achieve in our gyms like uh, diversity uh, and uh, gender ratio balance and training all together and this kind of like uh, this kind of like mixed training can tackle gender stereotypes because then you come to kind of revisit what you thought that certain bodies can do and cannot do and so on yeah i i think when we talk about when i asked about this women only training groups for example what i saw in in one of the gyms where i i trained for a while and uh, they had the women's training group which was not uh framed as a beginner's group so it was just a women's group in general but um, at least some women who had been training for a longer time they would not go to women's training group because they felt that it's like too much just like you know chatting and socializing and and the intensity was not as high and you wouldn't get a good sweat in the training so that the kind of the women's group was probably organized in a very gender stereotypical way that women want to have fun and socialize whereas the tougher training is is the men's training or or the mixed training so i think in that place it didn't work very well in a way that also women started to discriminate the women's group in the same way as we talked earlier that and that because they are not like the stereotypical women, so they would go to the mixed training group instead. Yeah, exactly. Thank you for this example. This is another, you know, way that this can go wrong and that you meet this like frequently. So it is like based on what ideas you have organized your, let's say, women only training. So yeah. if it is organized based on gender stereotypes, then it is not going to help much to tackle these kind of inequalities and stereotypes. On the contrary, it ends up reproducing them. So 
many people are thinking like why women are not coming and what can we do to bring here more and so on and then like if you think stereotypically you think oh they are not coming because women like by nature they don't want to train hard or they don't want to like to really fight they want to do some fitness boxing for example and so yeah. on like mm -hmm. And then you end up like organizing a class that even you don't want to join. And you see these classes like lasting for three months and then, you know, like they are like done. So because they are like uh, based on uh, stereotypes. So sometimes when women, when women ask me, uh, women martial artists ask me, oh, like we are just two and we, we want to do something in our class. How? how do you think we should like organize the the women's class or something and i always say that you should think how would you how you would like to train what would be don't try to think like what women want because like you end up thinking like with stereotypes what other women want like i mean you are a, you are a woman think what would be the ideal you know, training environment for you. What do you want from the training? Like, of course, we are different and we all want different things from the training. That's, that's for sure. But I think it is a better, you know, like point to start, to start from your experience than to start from, you know, just, just some assumptions of what other, like, uh, coach, you know, their women want. So, mm -hmm. like, I think it's safer to start from your own experience than from assumptions. So, think what would be the ideal, you know, like, if you could, if you could make the ideal training environment for you, what would you do? Yeah, if you want to sweat, you don't want to have this sexist language, you, you know, like, there is a good chance that you would, you know, other women can also find this environment nice and they can come to, to train and enjoy the class. Yeah, we we are ending up in like very difficult situations in the way that we earlier talked about how many of the elite athletes who you interviewed in your PhD, how they were uh, very much drawing on some of these very masculine discourses of sport and they were then in a way separating themselves from the other women. And we have been talking about the need to disrupt some of the masculine discourses and, and, and the meanings of sport that you have to be tough and aggressive and strong and resilient and never give up and, and how these need to be destabilized. But at the same time, the other danger is that we end up drawing on these very stereotypical feminine discourses and that these training spaces need to be organized in a completely different way. So it's it's difficult to start challenging these masculine discourses without then essentializing gender and, and ending up stereotyping in a, in a different way. I think it's difficult. I, I agree with you, but I think it's difficult to start challenging these discourses if we cannot recognize them. Yeah. So for me, that's the first step. Like, uh, like many, like, um, many times the, we are not very conscious of the ways that we are thinking and feeling or why we feel this way, why we think this way about women. So we are not yeah. very conscious of what kind of discourses we are reproducing with our practices. Uh, who benefits from those, who is oppressed, who is excluded from this kind of uh, practices and so on. So uh, I think we need to start by learning to recognize those. Because the same, exactly the same act, in my opinion, can have totally different uh, results if it is done kind of strategically and consciously or if it is done unconsciously. For example, yeah. like I like using the example with the color pink, that it is like employed by many women's teams as a you know like color for the logo or color for color for their clothes and so on. Yeah. So this, the use of this kind of color that is sometimes you know like the stereotypical like feminine girl color sometimes, if this if yeah. it is done unconsciously, like let's 
like for example you are thinking like oh i need to bring more women and girls in my team you know how should i uh, advertise the team or what kind of logo and clothes we should have oh let's make them girls like pink so let's uh, make them pink so this is a stereotypical mm -hmm. way of thinking yeah and it only you only end up reproducing this you know like stereotype but if you say that you know like we are a martial arts club and you know like pink is like always like stereotypically associated with femininity and girlhood and you know like being fragile and being you know like a girl and so on but let's take the color pink and let's use it in a way that we change this understanding and we saw that like for example like i like this like uh, work like this article by alex chan on like like pink gloves still give the black eyes so let's take this uh -huh. you know understandings around the color pink and you know like uh, change them so the same act using the say the color pink for a logo of a woman's team can have different effects if it is used like unconsciously based on stereotypical thinking or if it is used like consciously and strategically in order to, you know, like reverse, destabilize certain stereotypes. So for me, the difference mm. is whether you are reflecting on, you know, like what kind of like discourses you are reproducing with your, the ways you talk and the practices that you participate and who benefits from those. Yeah, I think that's a very nice example with the pink gloves or the use of the color pink. We always have the challenge that, of course, people who see these advertisements, they don't see the intentions of the person who has designed them. So the way that they are interpreting, for example, this new women's group, with, which is using the color pink in, in the advertisement, then people who see this advertisement will always bring different different meanings to that or how they interpret the message yeah of course it is always like a subject of interpretation yeah yeah but and i think you know like it is not again it is not the um, women to to blame for not being always you know like consciously or you know like seeing always behind things who is you know like um oppressed and who is benefits from this so it's not women to blame for not being always you know conscious of these things because we it is not in our education we don't you know we don't learn to think of these things mm. so yeah. like i think like first there should be some you know like education opportunities for all those involved in sport you know learning learning to recognize like this kind of gender dynamics how the gender stereotypes are reproduced this you know like discourses and how those are resisted and how they are you know like reproduced and so on learning to recognize these things like like being educated on that as a first step so that we can make conscious mm -hmm. uh, choices because many times, like most of the times, we all have very good intentions, you know, we want to have like a, an uh, inclusive, you know, like gym, but we don't know how to do it. And we often, you know, like employ the wrong strategies. Yeah, I think what we already discussed about women's training groups, like sometimes they will, there are good intentions behind that to have more women involved, but sometimes they work to actually reinforce the stereotypes and make it more difficult for for women to uh, probably feel accepted in in the martial art culture as well mm -hmm. exactly so what are your thoughts on in terms of also discursive interventions that that would be one approach how we how we could start trying to make a practical difference and, and a difference in in real world and we talked about these different discourses and how they impact how we construct our identities in in sports so what are your thoughts what kind of things could be helpful we can talk about martial arts that's 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 the context that you are mostly researching 
Um, that's a, that's a difficult question, but I think that I think that, for example, this like using as an example using the color pink in a way that that resists the stereotype and attempts to change the meaning around pink, femininity, girlhood, and so on. So this is a discursive, like a discursive intervention, right? Or using the word girl in a different, because, you know, like there are, the word girl is often like used to minimize, you know, like women athletes. So when we talk about uh, men in sport, elite, you know, male athletes, we talk about men and so on. We talk yeah. about boys. But often when we refer to women, we talk about girls and so on. So one could could uh, argue against, you know, calling women girls. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, there are other athletes that they like the word girl and they, you know, like, they, they have used this conscious strategies to try to, to switch the meaning of the word. And I mean, the same is with the word queer, for example. The, the word queer has a history of, you know, it was used as a negative term for LGBT people. And then it was adopted for the, from the community in order to, 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 to switch the meaning, but also like to keep this history of, of oppression and marginalization. So I think these are kind of like uh, discursive interventions in a way that have been used from the members of the community themselves, from people, yeah. in the, from women in the sports clubs, for, from um, members of the, from the LGBT community and so on. So there are community-based kind of discursive interventions. So if we think from the, um, the other direction, I don't know what else to say, to say like, uh, except from, you know, like education, like uh, including these kind of like uh, courses in the uh, gender courses in the education for coaches and uh, for all people involved, all people involved in sport or for, you know, like the media. This is very important and we forgot to mention that. The, the way that athletes are represented and talked about in the media or mm. the ways that uh, we write and we use our social media as sports people. Yeah. So you could kind of use this means strategically in order to like unstabilize the dominant discourses. Yeah. Just like you said, the first step probably in striving towards this is also to become, just to become aware how much uh, significance the types of words we use are, are going to have and how many of us when having good intentions and, and we are hoping to do a good thing in terms of inclusivity and, and uh, challenging this binary thinking as well. But often we we lack awareness of of certain things that the way that we talk about things and write about things that they can actually be reproducing this uh, this binary as well as the as the hierarchical gender order in sports. So I think that's a very important message for all of us. And of course, we need protective policies. Let's not forget that not all countries have those in place yet. But uh, yeah, those are not those alone are not enough. So we need also like you know to to make the effort to change the cultural to make those cultural changes that we talked about. Uh, some of the things we are now working together on on doing this review on martial arts, and we are looking at at spirituality and and meaningful experiences. And one of the ideas that we had was to also look into who has access to these meaningful experiences in sport. And I had this podcast with the uh, Meaningful Physical Education Research Group, Deirdre, uh, Nick Ronin and Tim Fletcher, and they were pointing out these certain things about physical education. So, for example, those who have higher levels of skills and, and who are doing well and 
succeeding, they are more likely to have these meaningful experiences, whereas those who might be lacking those um, skills might not have as physical as meaningful experience. Maybe they don't want to do anything after after finishing PE and then when they don't have to, they wouldn't engage with any of that. So mm -hmm. maybe just some of your some of your thoughts about all this what we discussed about gender and the complexity of gender. What are your thoughts on how how gender influences who has access to to meaningful experiences in sport and, and physical culture? Yeah, I think it's, it definitely plays a role because, like, as we said, that the gender is one of the few institutions that are still organized based on gender. So we have all yeah. these kind of gender stereotypes that are very, like, powerful, like, in the, like the ways that we practice sport. And uh, I had many, like, uh, many of the people that, uh, I interviewed, like, um, like for example, like they shared stories about you know their early experiences in uh, physical education in school and how yeah. they felt very alienated, especially like uh, young LGBT people, like uh, how they felt very uh, alienated by this culture. They felt like it was like a class that you were like. It was almost teaching you how to be a man or how to be a woman. Right. Or, or it was like, in the same time, it was like, um, like, uh, like one of my participants, like, uh, was describing, it was always like, uh, organized based on, you know, like very militarized or policed kind of way of, you know, instructing things. And also like focusing on performance and competition and uh, so on. And these elements were kind of like uh, alienating people that were, you know, not interested or rejecting these ideas. Yeah. The gender binary, mm -hmm. for example, like, or, the, you know, gender roles, you know, so, you know, like becoming a, man or a woman this kind of like rigid gender roles uh, about masculinity and femininity or you know like the um, competition and performance in the in the elite sport system so so like back to the question so who has access to these experiences so i think where many people uh, feel alienated in this like binary sport system and in that sense they are having they are like they feel alienated and they are having like they in a way they are denied you know like access to meaningful experiences in sport because they don't fit this logic binary logic of thinking yeah mm -hmm. exactly exactly or if we think about women you know like mothers for example or you know like um women that are not anymore 20 years old or something so for for women many many studies have pointed out that this you know cultural understandings that we have for womanhood there is a stricter timeline of you know when when you can do things and what are meaningful pursuits like according to your age like as a woman or something yeah. So, like, uh, can you be an elite athlete when you are a woman at your forties with two kids? Or mm. does it even make sense, you know, to spend so much time to do exercise and sport instead of, you know, like doing other things for your family? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So I think that gender or gender understanding, like, definitely. Uh, overlap with like meaning systems in uh, in uh, sport and with also like how we feel and think about our experiences and how we construct meaning and whether you know we find uh, the activity meaningful or not like for example I felt like for for many years I, I like I admit that I have been like very uh, performance and uh, competition orientated for many years and when I you know at some point uh, growing older 
and uh, working more and having less uh, time to train and more injuries and so on, I couldn't uh, anymore like, um, you know, like achieve these kind of elite performances. And then like I started having this like uh, crisis of meaning, like, is it, you know, like, why am I doing sport now? Is it still meaningful? And, you know, like I was having this crisis for like, two years or something it like I was really struggle with my emotions about sport and my you know what I, what am I doing uh, now here and this was yeah. because I was like so much so much embedded in this kind of like uh, performance orientated discourses and I was like having trouble to you know like enjoy sport out outside of of those yeah yeah, in, in this elite sport performance-oriented discourse, if you are no longer reaching a new level of, of performance and achievement, and unless you're able to do it seriously and, and keep progressing, then it seems that there is like little point mm -hmm. to, to be doing that. Yeah, I think those are very important messages for for us to be thinking about further, and, and I'm most certain we will be writing about these things together as well and you already pointed out well it's gender is of course one thing age is another thing that you very clearly brought up in terms of who has access to meaningful experience is also bound to age and how sport is thought to be this project of youth and when you get older then it's time to stop spending so much time on sport and it's time for you to do something more serious and more responsible and, and those kind of things yeah i i have very much enjoyed our talk and and it has really been wonderful can you maybe come up with a couple of few closing words for our listeners so if you hope that they will remember one or two things from our talk what what could they be closing thoughts let's see <laughs> yeah well i think if i want you know like people to remember one sentence out of this it would be like try to be uh, mindful of the of the effects that uh, what you say what you do and the practices that you participate uh, have like if we if we try to to reflect and uh, think more of you know where does this come from you know the way that i am thinking and the way that i am talking where does it come from what is the history behind of that and uh, um, who do we exclude this way you know then we might end up you know like doing things uh, differently because like uh, as we discussed, you know, many times the intentions are good, but just there is no, yeah. you know, like uh, conscious uh, thinking behind it or the ability to, you know, like uh, to observe these uh, dynamics. Mm. Yeah, thank you again for this this wonderful discussion. I, I really enjoyed it and, and I think we are addressing some very, very important questions for all of us interested in sport, exercise and movement culture to, to think about. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you for again for having me, Nora. It was a pleasure discussing with you. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Through Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever app you use. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show. It would be a great help for us. We have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes. So be sure to tune in. Thank you all for your support and have a great day.